I'm listening. I am listening. Spirit, speak to me. I'm listening. I am listening. Spirit, speak to me. My ears are wide open. My eyes are now open to see what I may be. I'm listening. I am listening. Spirit, speak to me. I'm listening. I am listening. In this moment, a spirit speaks to me. I can hear the voices of all my kids. I'm listening. Singing. I'm listening. Tweeting. How singing to who? My ears are wide open, and oh, oh, the joy. My eyes are wide open, oh, oh, the love to see and to hear for you be. and me. Oh, oh, oh. I'm listening in this moment of silence. I am listening. I hear spirit speak. Did you sleep well? Mm-hmm. Can I ask you a favor? Can you go and push with Jake for five minutes while I finish? You see, I'm doing some worky stuff. For five seconds? Five minutes. You'll see how long. It's not very long. How many seconds is five minutes? Well, it's 300 seconds, but... You don't have to count to 300. I'll just be in there to get you when I'm all done, okay? Um, so who's going to have to count to 300? I'll do it. Okay. Meditation hymn this morning by Leah Morris. You who are parenting or otherwise caring for children and trying to work at the same time might see yourselves and your behind the scenes reflected the end of her offering. All that you touch, you change. All that you change, changes you. The only lasting truth is change. God is change. Thus begins the science fiction novel, The Parable of the Sower by Octavia Butler. Written in the early 1990s, this book and its companion, The Parable of the Talents, tell the story of Lauren Olamina, a young black girl, eldest daughter of the town preacher, and the unfolding of her struggle to survive the 2020s and 30s in the US under climate catastrophe, resulting widespread violence, terror, privatization of water and hunger that abound. Lauren writes verses charting a religion or a system of belief she calls Earthseed about human beings, what we owe each other, about destiny, and about God. She doesn't say she's created this system. She says she's discovered what is being revealed to her, what she knows to be true. 
that in a time of chaos, the only lasting truth is change. So after her family dies and her town is burned to the ground, she journeys north, gathering followers using these principles of earth seed. They learn, struggle, change, grow, plan, survive, and try to treat each other humanely in an inhumane time. And Lauren says this about God, writing to herself in her journal, wrestling with these questions. She says, a lot of people seem to believe in a big daddy God or a big cop God or a big king God. They believe in a kind of super person. A few believe God is just another word for nature. And nature turns out to mean just about anything they happen to not understand or feel in control of. Some say God is a spirit, a force, an ultimate reality. Ask seven people what all of that means and you'll get seven different answers. So what is God? Just another name for whatever makes you feel special and protected? There's a big early season storm blowing itself out in the Gulf of Mexico. It's bounced around the Gulf killing people from Florida to Texas and down into Mexico. There are over 700 known dead so far, one hurricane. And how many people has it hurt? How many are going to starve later because of destroyed crops? That's nature. Is it God? Lauren is asking high stakes questions here. I suggest to you that theology is important only when it asks high stakes questions, questions about human nature, about suffering, about comfort, about meaning, questions about what we are, what shapes us into people who are living more fully, more humanely in our time in history with its particular and specific inhumanity. John Murray preached about universal salvation in a time when many people were very concerned about hell, actively concerned about who was saved and who was damned. And perhaps some of you have experienced the very real psychological torment of fearing your own eternal damnation. And so you can understand why those questions about God are crucial, crucial questions about human beings too. And then therefore have serious implications for how we treat each other. At the same time, early European arrivals to this continent seeking their own religious freedom turned to their religion to justify killing native people and displacing them. Turned to their religion to justify enslaving people. What good? are questions about God, if they're not also questions about us and how we ought to live. Unitarian theologian, James Luther Adams writes about the five smooth stones of liberal religion. And by liberal religion, he means religion concerned with freedom, primarily the freedom of belief, but also the freedom of real human beings in their lives. And in fact, at this moment in history, right now, the conversation between liberal religious traditions like ours and liberation theology is precisely this. Liberation theology is primarily concerned with telling the story of a God who is on the side of the oppressed, who brings good news to the captives, who raises up every valley and makes the rough places plain, who topples the mighty from their thrones and brings freedom to those who suffer in bondage, not in the life hereafter, but in this life. Liberal theology has been primarily concerned about freedom of thought, the application of reason to various church doctrines, and only secondarily about the freedom of real human beings in their lives, in their bodies in this time in history. So these five smooth stones that Adams writes about are drawn from the story of David and Goliath in the Hebrew Bible, where David, the small Israelite boy, fells the giant Goliath with five smooth stones in his hand and the mightiness of the God of his people sparing the armies of the Israelites and the Philistines 
much bloodshed. So Adams claims that these are the tools, these five smooth stones are the tools with which religious people care, who care about freedom come to know God and help to make the world right. In this sermon series over the next few months, we'll examine and allow history and our present reality to complicate and complement these five smooth stones. And we'll discover for ourselves, what is it that echoes through the ages? So the first one, perhaps illustrated best by Lauren Olamina's idea that God is change. Religious liberalism depends on the principle that revelation is continued. Adams writes, the first tenet of the free person's faith is that our ultimate dependence for being in freedom is upon a creative power and upon processes not of our own making. Our ultimate faith is not in ourselves. Within this framework, the person finds something dependable and also many things that are not dependable. One thing that is dependable is the order of nature and of history, which the sciences are able to describe with varying degrees of precision. Adam goes, Adams goes on to say how long the order of nature will continue to support human life is beyond our ken. Probably our earth and our sun will one day cool off and freeze. Moreover, everyone is condemned to what we call death. Whatever the destiny of the planet or of the individual life, the sustaining meaning is discernible and commanding here and now. Every blade of grass, every work of art, every scientific endeavor, every striving for righteousness bears witness to this meaning. And indeed, every frustration or perversion of truth, beauty, or goodness also bears this witness as the shadow points around the sun. I hear echoes of this principle that revelation is ongoing and Lauren Olamina's conviction that God is change in each other. I don't know that Octavia Butler read James Luther Adams, though she is a brilliant theological thinker and it would not surprise me. It may interest you to know that she published The Parable of the Sower in 1993 and Adams died in 1994. The echoes of history don't necessarily start quite that long ago. So here's what I take from this section of Adams writing, a sustaining meaning is discernible and commanding here and now. Even given climate chaos, even given the eventual heat death of the universe, even given the failures of the institutions around us to care for us, even given our own mortality, a sustaining meaning is discerning, is discernible and commanding here and now. And I encourage you in your personal spiritual journey alongside these, your companions, to seek first that sustaining meaning and let it command your life. You do not have to use the word God if that word doesn't help you grow spiritually. But neither do you have to reject out of hand there are meaningful questions to be asked about God or about ideas about God. This is the discipline of theology. I used to call myself an atheist until I realized that in doing so, I was accepting someone else's definition of God and then rejecting that instead of turning to the resources of our tradition and my own direct experience of the holy mystery to help me define for myself what God might be and why that might be important. I was agreeing that God was a sort of cop in the sky in whom I did not believe. And for me, what that meant is that I closed myself to hymns, poetry, religious thinkers, other people, conversations that could have illuminated my path because I did not know how to use or understand that word or why it mattered. No longer. Instead, I remain on a journey to draw ever closer to the source of life and to let it change me. 
It's necessary sometimes to profess and proclaim disbelief, to say no to things that hurt or ideas that leave us cold and bereft. You do not have to use words that have been used to hurt you. You do not have to use words that feel irrelevant or confuse you. You are welcome in this community, in this project of spiritually seeking together, no matter what you believe about the sustaining and commanding reality around us. Eventually, the journey of personal faith in community requires some saying yes, some assenting to what Adams calls that commanding reality outside of our own whims or impulses. And what we know to be true is that that reality is revealed over and over in a disorienting, ever-changing way. There is change and possibility yet in this city, in this town, in this moment in history. There is new life always being breathed into us, in our lives, in the concepts we have inherited, into our traditions, into our neighborhoods, blowing like the wind that kept John Murray ashore. Did Murray believe that it was God in the winds, an active God intervening in his life? Did he believe it was fate? Did he believe it was weather? I don't know. What I do know is that the winds blew and Murray listened to the commanding reality that was before him and it changed his life. Revelation is continuous, not only in our living tradition, not only in our ideas about God, but in your very life. There is always, always something possible even after loss, even after terrible injury, even after the divorce, even after your dream has died, even after you've started drinking again, even after your friends have betrayed you, even after eviction or after deportation, after imprisonment, after assault, after you are the one who has done the worst thing, the unimaginable thing. Even then, more is possible, more is being revealed. Some people have begun celebrating February Black History Month as Black Futures Month. New life is being breathed into the ghosts and rebellions of history. Black people in this practice of celebrating Black future are claiming birthright freedom, are examining the lessons of history to dream of a flourishing future, celebrating not only the accomplishments of yesteryear, but predicting, divining, co-creating the changes about to be birthed. There are political and creative movements all around us. We saw glimpses this summer in the riots and rebellions and marches. Freedom movements are a part of ongoing revelation too. Freedom movements arise when people who live in conditions of bondage, inheriting the legacy of stolen labor, stolen land, stolen wealth, stolen autonomy, feel the freedom that is all, always already theirs as human beings on a personal level, a spiritual level, a collective level, and then rise up together to make it material, make it political, give it shape in this place, in this time, in history. And perhaps for all of us the world over, there is something else possible, something more just, something more loving, something more free, reaching for us now, inviting our participation, being revealed, calling us by name. Is there something like that at work in your life? Is there something unfolding something being revealed, something calling to you, something deep and real, maybe something beyond sense, but something you know to be true. Some way you are being called forward to conspire with the eternal, something that is begging to be born. Revelation is ongoing at 
every level of our lives and a great and terrifying gift of living, of turning toward that commanding reality is that we are an active part in it. May you be strengthened to answer that call wherever the winds of change blow you. And so may we all. Amen. Will you join me in our hymn number